from downtown Scranton, this is Northeast Current. WQPX invites you to join us as we explore public affairs, current events, and arts and culture in Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania. Now let's meet today's guests on Northeast Current. I'm Cindy Wooden. I'm with the Center for Anti-Slavery Studies in Montrose, Pennsylvania, and I am the secretary of the organization. We also call this CASS, C-A-S-S, -S, so that's what I will be saying during the presentation. Um, CASS was formed in 1996 by a group of people who really wanted to save the AME Zion Church in the lower part of town on Berry Street. And it kind of expanded from there, not just uh, to learn about history of those who escaped on the Underground Railroad in Susquehanna County, but it expanded through 10 counties in our area. And so our five displays that we have cover those particular counties. Um, we have this main display, which is here in the front parlor, which deals with the Center for Anti-Slavery itself and how it began. Uh, it, it covers uh, the church, uh, led to a realization, which opened up more questions. We were able to acquire uh, family photographs from the families that had lived and grown up here in Montrose, and a lot of these photographs came from those, that particular family. And therefore, we just expanded to other counties as well. We got a lot of information from Bradford County as well as Susquehanna County, and then expanded to Lackawanna and Luzerne counties as well as the eastern counties of Wayne, Pike, Carbon, and Monroe. Um, we acquired this house in the year 2000, not knowing all of its history at the time, but understanding that it was a home to someone between 1840 and 1890. Turned out he was one of the abolitionists in town, married to the daughter of one of the abolitionists on the board of the Center for Anti of the board of the Anti-Slavery Society. Um, very interesting history. Then later we found out that also a Mr. William B. Aney owned the property for about 30 years, 1890 to 1920. And he became in 1911 uh, congressman uh, in, in Washington. Uh, so that was exciting news also. Uh, here in the front parlor, we think this was part of the original structure, which was uh, started in about 1816 or 15 and uh, finished in about 1817. It was started as a bank, the first bank in Susquehanna County by Robert H. Rose was a philanthropist who had moved here from Philadelphia in the early 1800s. Um, he thought it was necessary for the people to have bank facilities available and he uh, started the first subscriptions in 1814. It only lasted as a bank until 1829 when he decided that was enough of that apparently <laughs> and closed the bank down. By this time there were other banks in the area. Uh, the building was expanded uh, when it became a residence in about 1830 when uh, a wing, which is no longer on the house, was added. Now there is a large front porch where most people enter. Uh, and that wing was taken off in about 1921. Meanwhile, Dr. Amy had added another wing on the other end of the house, which became a library. And for about possibly 25 years, the building was actually symmetrical. It's the only time it ever was. Uh, th this parlor has a fireplace, and the library at the other end of the house has a fireplace. It was apparently used for heating, both uh, downstairs and the upstairs, and uh, it is no longer in use. Um, we're just using it for decorative purposes. This is a model of the AME Zion Church. Uh, the church was built in 1859, one of two black churches in Montrose. The other one was AME Bethel. Um, the Congregation for the 1859 Church AME Zion uh, was started in about 1840 when for some of the first blacks who arrived in town uh, decided that they needed a place to worship. Uh, my father happened to have built this model, which has a bell that works, <laughs> a door that opens, and a roof that comes off. This is pretty much the way the interior of the church still looks, um, although it is closed to the public at the present time. Mm -hmm. it, did have, it did have a balcony, and that is where their library was located. Many of the books in the library were donated by uh, other church 
denominations in town. And I think there were probably 300 books in the library when we went through them. This exhibit tells the story of William Smith, who was one of the uh, freedom seekers who came to Montrose in about 1842. He was one of the ones who helped establish the AME Zion Church, and then he uh, built his house right next to it. Uh, David Post was one of the founders of the town, um, owned property on that particular side of town, and he was the one who provided those who stayed in Pleasant Valley and built their homes, provided them with um, the ability to purchase the land and build their homes. This uh, picture here is of the of William Smith House, which is right next to the AME Zion Church. William Smith was um, a preacher. He was not a minister because he was not ordained, but he could preach uh, a, good, a good word, apparently. And he often substituted when the regular AME Zion minister was not able to get to Montrose. Usually, uh, the AME Zion minister was an itinerant minister, and he had two or three churches. Montrose being one of them, sometimes it was partnered with the church in Binghamton, sometimes with a church in Norwich, um, possibly with the church in Tawanda. And uh, so he preached for 35 years when the minister was not able to be there. Um, there are still some of his descendants in the area um, with a different last name. There are no Smith residents here, but with other last names. His, one of his sons became a, um, served in the United States Colored Troops during the Civil War, and he was able to come back home. He was one of 33 men from Susquehanna County who joined the Civil War troops. There were a couple of white fellows who were uh, officers in the Colored Troops. That was the way it was done in those days. And Charles Smith became a minister in the AME Zion uh, Church when he returned from the service. The other gentleman whose picture is here is Jonathan Jasper Wright, who was uh, brought up in Springville, just 10 miles down the road. And he became the first African American to pass the bar in Pennsylvania after the Emancipation Proclamation, 1866. Meanwhile, he had gone south in 1863 or 4 to help with uh, Freedmen's Bureau, uh, became an advisor to General Oliver Howard, who founded Howard University in Washington, D.C., and later went to South Carolina, where he became one of the senators of South Carolina and later part of the South Carolina Supreme Court. Um, he was ousted out of his position, along with many of the other black gentlemen who had become senators and Supreme Court justices during the Jim Crow period. and. Uh, later died at age 45 of tuberculosis. He was able to accomplish much in his time. There is, an, a, there is an historical marker in Springville commemorating him at this time. And uh, the other gentleman here that I would like to mention is Jermaine Wesley Logan, who became a bishop in the AME Zion Church Conference, which basically was based in New York State. He was an escaped slave also from Tennessee who came to New York State by way of Hamilton, Colorado, right, Hamilton, Canada, <laughs> and gained his education. He had not learned to read or write until he was 21. Uh, gained his education in um, upstate New York and became a minister in the AME Zion Church. He was known as the Underground Railroad King of New York State because he basically was interested in starting Underground Railroad safe houses for those who were escaping through the state. He also started many black schools for those who decided to stay in the state, to stay and remain. His daughter, Amelia, was one of the first teachers in a black school in Binghamton. She later married uh, Frederick Douglass' son, Lewis, following the Civil War. Um, very close connection there. Um, Jermaine Logan was the pastor here in Montrose from 1851 uh, to 1853. Um, so we like to think that it's possible Frederick Douglass, his son and daughter-in-law were able to come through here too. We know that Frederick Douglass did speak in Tawanda, which is not that far away. We're now in the foyer of the Silver Lake Bank, which is what we call our cast center. Um, 
this was a name given to it by, by Robert H. Rose when he built it. Uh, he lived at Silver Lake, which is why it's called Silver Lake Bank. Uh, the mirror on this wall was not originally in this part of the house. It was located in the hallway, which is on the other side of this wall. We, lo we, we relocated the mirror to the foyer because in the, uh, according to legend, uh, there, was lar there were large mirrors in front of the entry door so that if any evil would come in the front door, it could be reflected back out. When we took the uh, powder room out of the middle of the hallway, which someone had placed it there in the past, uh, we wanted to move the mirror, which was in the hallway facing the front door. And so one of our um, artists in construction was able to duplicate the woodwork uh, from the hallway, and we moved the mirror here. It has really added a nice focal point to this particular room. Um, while we're in this room, we might notice the uh, radiators. They were in a sorry state, having been painted many years ago, and the paint was peeling off and cracking, falling on the floor. When we redid the house, uh, we had the radiators taken out, sandblasted, and repainted. And even though we have since changed the heating system, they are here for <laughs> admiration purposes. They, some of them are very intricately uh, decorated, and we think they're kind of a grand thing. Okay, this is the music room. I suppose it wasn't always the music room, but especially since this was a bank to start with. Uh, but at least the two different families taught music in this particular room, so that's how it is named. Uh, the piano that is here, uh, I bought from a friend. It had belonged to his grandmother who lived in Wilkes-Barre at the time, so it's a little spinet um, and needs a little tuning, but it works just fine. The music room could be closed off from the rest of the house by uh, French doors as well as pocket doors, which still work, but they're a little bit sticky. The display that is right here is the Underground Railroad Quilt Code display that I started when I first became acquainted with CAS. I had given a lecture on the Underground Railroad Quilt Code theory at my first meeting, and they asked me to come back and do some more. So later I found two different quilt patterns, which were pre-printed, the North Star pattern as well as the Bear Paw pattern. And I found those at Walmart and quilted them up and showed them to the group and they decided they wanted to make some of those for sale at the annual 4th of July event that the, the townspeople put on here every 4th of July. And that was successful. Then I started classes teaching uh, people how to quilt, and we used the quilt code, code blocks for that purpose. I extended the patterns that were used uh, to demonstrate the different blocks that people might have used on the Underground Railroad. Whether they were used here or not is anyone's guess. It is um, a theory only. It cannot be proven or disproven, but it is an oral history based on a family from North Carol South Carolina, um, Ozella McDaniels Williams family out of Charleston, South Carolina. Very interesting book. It is written up in Hidden in Plain View by Jacqueline Tobin and Raymond Dobard. This is the library wing. We think it was put on the house by uh, Dr. William B. D. B. Ainey, probably sometime between 1890 and, two and 1900. Um, Someone else had built in the, the bookshelves that are here. I believe uh, Mr. Ainey had the Barrister's bookcases uh, all along the wall since he was a lawyer. <clears throat> Some, before we sanded the floor, you could still see the indentations from the bookshelves on, on the floor. But these were added later. We have put our uh, Black History, Black Studies library in this particular area with uh, the the Barrister's bookcases holding slavery and Underground Railroad history, and in the neighboring room, uh, Civil War history. We have many more books upstairs and that need to be processed and put on the shelves, but it is a growing library. Also here we have Jonathan Jasper Wright's portrait, um, which uh, we still have portraits for sale. 
and a book that tells about him. The book is not all about him, but about many black lawyers uh, from around the country. And uh, so this is his prominent place right now. The other items we have here is, are, is a black angel doll and, uh, of course, Addie, the American Girl doll, and a couple of other dolls that uh, either were given to me or I purchased. Um, we expect that in the future we will have uh, computer technology here so that people can bring their uh, personal computers or their iPads or whatever, do some research if they'd like to. Uh, we will have a copier available. They can copy whatever they type uh, or as, in, as the libraries do, pay for copying. Um, so we will be open probably officially by next year which is, we'll be celebrating the 200th anniversary of the, center, of the Silver Lake Bank, the 20th year of the Sil Center for Anti-Slavery Studies. We're in the middle of the hallway here, standing uh, by the doorway that used to be a powder room in the middle of the hall. And when we were redoing the house, we decided, after much discussion, that we would take it out of the hallway. And as soon as it was gone, it was like that was the way it was supposed to be. We moved the powder room underneath the stairway and uh, have a slight uh, a draw door so that it, someone who with a walker can still make entry into the, door, into the powder room. <laughs> this kitchen has seen a lot of work on it. It was originally smaller and then at one point in time uh, the people turned the back porch into part of the kitchen and that's why you will see later that the back area has a sloped roof, which caused many problems as far as drainage off the roof was concerned. And it has had leaked for many years. We think we've got that under control now. Um, meanwhile, we have put in all new cabinetry, all new plumbing, uh, new stove, new refrigerator, new lighting, etc. And we still have some work to go. Uh, the cabinetry is... Uh, is a maple with an ash finish and uh, we hope to duplicate uh, some more of this on the other wall for floor to ceiling china. In the meantime we've been able to accumulate some china in this particular pattern and set came from a, a Daughters of the American Revolution, DAR, sister of mine, who was finding a home for it and she wanted to find a good place. It was her great aunt's for whom she was named and she was delighted at the last meeting we had to see that it was being used. Our sink we had custom made. I wanted a, a farmhouse type sink, thinking that would be a, an old type uh, uh, look, which we've been very pleased with. So it is a one piece soapstone. I understand they, they hollow it out with water treatment until it gets to be uh, the right depth and so on. And then we were able to have engraved on the front of it, Silver Lake Bank, established 1814 by R.H. Rose. People ask us, was that the original sink? <laughs> and we say, no, it is brand new. But it added a nice ambiance to the kitchen. This, this looks like it's an old-fashioned stove, although it is obviously not completely. Some of the works on here are just for decoration. We saw this at uh, a local stove manufacturer and they ordered it from Canada for us. It is made to look like an old-fashioned stove. It happens to be gas. We asked for six burners. It does have a warming oven. It does have a warming oven. And everyone will say, oh, well, let's open the oven. And they'll try to do this and it doesn't work because the whole, the whole front comes down. <laughs> And people say, I remember when my grandmother or my, or my great aunt or someone had a stove and the upper area was for the warming oven. And this is where the controls are now. It is a very nice piece and a, a center point of the kitchen here. Uh, the Center for Anti-Slavery Studies, I, as I said, was formed in 1996. It started with the church and led to a realization this extraordinary story must be told. It started with the church and led to a realization, which opened up more questions for all of us. Why haven't we heard of this before? So we had to dig deeper. What people lived for were family and home, 
They worked at occupations and education. What they put their trust in were faith and friends. And what they fought for was military and civic duty. And these are the items that are featured on three of our other displays, the county displays. Each one of them deals with those particular themes. Suddenly, history now has faces. It has names and it inhabits places. But these faces, these names, and these places are in danger of being lost to time. And this is why CAS exists, to preserve history and make it accessible, encouraging all generations to keep telling their stories. These uh, exhibits were, were produced with the help of many people. And from them came our book called A Place I Call Home, which it, Sherman Wooden is responsible for getting started and finishing up. Um, our website is www.cass-montrose, that's C-A-S-S hyphen M-O-N-T-R-O-S-E dot org. Uh, you can contact us through our home phone, 570-278-3199. Uh, we are open by appointment only at this point in time and hopefully at least one day a week by 2016 uh, in celebration of our 200th anniversary of this building. Um, Sherman Wooden is the president of the organization. I am the secretary. Uh, Thomas Wooden is the treasurer. And we do have a board of directors as well. Thank you for visiting with us today. My name is Cindy Wooden, secretary of CAS. Uh, and we would love to have you come to Montrose. Just give us a call to make an appointment. Thanks again.